Hey, it's NPR's Book of the Day. I'm Andrew Limbaugh. A murder mystery is an interesting vehicle to explore, sure, obviously violence, but also power, gender, and love. Today, we've got two thrillers that touch on class in different ways. In a bit, we'll hear about a book that's drawing a lot of comparisons to Crazy Rich Asians. (laughs) You know, if Crazy Rich Asians opened with someone waking up with bruised knuckles and bloody fingernails. But first, Paula Hawkins' latest book, A Slow Fire Burning, was inspired by walks she'd take in a London neighborhood where, and I'll quote her on this, you have the rich and poor mashed together cheek by jowl. And she talked to NPR's Mary Louise Kelly about walking around there and scoping out the best place to hide a dead body. The writer Paula Hawkins likes to take walks near where she lives in London, which happens to be near the Regent's Canal where a lot of houseboats are moored. As she walks, Hawkins is looking around, scouting for the perfect place to dispose of a body. Well, a body does indeed turn up in London and on a houseboat in Hawkins' new summer thriller, A Slow Fire Burning. You may already know her work. She also wrote The Girl on the Train. Paula Hawkins, welcome. Hi, it's great to talk with you. Um, allow me to hope that your hunt for the perfect spot to stash a body is is purely in the service of your, of your fiction. <laughs> Uh, yes, well, for the moment, in any case. Um, you know, I don't actually think I'm alone in doing this. I think it's something that all crime writers do, that as you wander around wherever you are, you look at places, yes, to dispose of a body, maybe to get away with murder. You know, and- <laughs> Can I, I'm going to object and say that my walks are, are interesting, <laughs> but, but I don't think I'm looking for a place to stash a body. But perhaps that's why you keep coming out with, with thrillers, with murders at the center of them. Yeah, it's difficult these days because getting away with murder is not what it once was. There's so much, you know, there's so many cameras around and everybody's got phones. So we have to work harder to to make our plots work, I think. So that's Mm. why I'm always kind of alert to this Mm. sort of thing. Well, take us on your walk. I want to kind of get a picture in my head. Where, Where exactly are we? Where are we walking? What do we see? Right. So we're walking up through the heart of London through Clerkenwell and Islington and we get to Regent's Canal, which Regent's Canal cuts all the way across London. And But there's a section in the middle, which is the section I'm talking about. And okay. there are houseboats there. It's, it's one of the bits of London that was quite bombed during the war. So you have old houses and new, you have rich and poor mashed and together, cheek by jowl. So it's a great, it's a great milieu for, for a novel and particularly for a crime novel, I think, where you have the powerful and the powerless rubbing up against each other. Mm. And then talk about how you spun that into the opening chapters of this novel. Well, as I was wandering around looking for my places to get rid of someone, I I, I noticed that there is a couple of the boats on, on the canal that are really, they've looked like they haven't moved for years. They're sort of slightly listing, sinking into the water. They've, the windows are grimy. It did just strike me that pretty much anything could be inside and you wouldn't necessarily know. And that's kind of what set my mind going. And I'd also been thinking about a character for quite a while. And this is something that I do, that I live with a character for a long time before I write them. Mm-hmm. That was certainly the case with, with Rachel from The Girl on the Train. And that was the case with one of the, the key characters in this novel, which is a woman called Laura, a young woman who has had a lot of difficulties in her young life. Um, and she, in the, at, at the opening chapter of the book, spends the night with somebody on a houseboat he then turns up dead and she is the chief suspect. And that's where we kick off. And then I sort of built a little cast of characters around these people, right. all of whom are in, are sort of linked in, in certain ways. Right. You set up kind of three central female characters, any one of whom, depending on where we are in the book, we might be thinking, oh, it totally was her. It totally was her. And then you read the next chapter and you're like, oh, I don't know, might, it, might, might go the other way here. So yes, we have Laura, who's in her 20s, as I mentioned. Then you have Miriam, who's an older woman. She's in her 50s. And she is one of the ha- inhabitants of the houseboats. She has a very nice houseboat just along from where this body was found. When we start to sort of find out a bit more about her, there seems to be more to Miriam. She's, she's definitely not telling the truth to the police. And she has something very, very dark in her past. And she's carrying a lot of anger and bitterness around inside her. And the other character is the aunt of the murdered, who, again, has, had, has suffered a terrible loss, a tragedy in her personal life. Stay with the, the 
point you just made about the characters who are just carrying a lot with them, because there's tragedy in this book beyond the murder with which it opens. Um, there's the loss of a child, and several of your characters are, are wrestling with grief over that or are destroyed by grief over that. Um, other of your characters seem to me to be trying with somewhat more success to heal from awful events in their past, and I wondered... I wondered what you're saying here about about loss or about relationships. Well, I think the way I tend to, to build characters is I tend to have in my mind something which scars them or marks them or is, is a fundamental event in their lives. And then they're all they're all fairly ordinary people, really, on the surface of it. But I'm I am interrogating how tragedy and trauma affect us and what um, the different ways in which we respond to things, whether we try to avenge ourselves or whether we try to forgive and what that actually means for us as people and and whether in some circumstances these things are even possible. I mean, I wonder, have you come to any conclusions about why some people, whether it's real people or, or characters who you're building, why some people survive great tragedy, great loss, and, and others don't and are destroyed by it? I, I don't think I have a, a simple answer for that. And I think because so much depends on your individual character, on your support network. But I think perhaps how open you are to seeking help, I think sometimes is 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 probably a big part of it. I think in my characters in the novel haven't maybe necessarily sought help in the ways they ought to. They've sort of turned inside and tried to hold everything inside. And it's that holding everything inside that is eating away at them. Having said that, I think that not all of us seek help easily. And that's not necessarily our fault either. It has to do with upbringing and, you know, the way we're taught and that kind of thing. So I think there are just so many different factors in there. But for me and my characters in this, I think it's partly the, the way they have turned inside and tried to hold everything inside instead of perhaps being more open and dealing with it. Hmm. The girl on the train um, was famously narrated by, by an unreliable narrator. She's telling you things and you're not sure. <laughs> whether to believe her or not. And it does occur to me in this book, we are, you have a number of main characters and we're seeing different pieces of what may have unfolded through different people's eyes. But for the most part, I found myself kind of buying their accounts and believing them. And I mean, I'm curious um, what made you feel like you were ready to write, to write a novel like that? Well, I mean, I still, I still believe that all of us are at some point point on a scale of unreliability when we're, we're telling our stories. So yes, I, I guess Rachel was was fairly extreme and that had to do in, the, in her unreliability. And that had to do with a very specific thing with her. And it was the fact that she drank too much and sometimes she couldn't remember what she'd done and she filled in blanks and that sort of thing. So she had a particular problem. For me, the, the way that I narrate is actually quite sort of realist, is people shaping their stories. Nobody really tells the whole the, the whole truth, do they? None of us do that on a regular basis every day. We are always always kind of shading some things out and dropping other things in. So I think it, you know, we're all on a, you know, on a scale of some sort there. Um, but yes, they are more straightforward. But that is partly to do with the fact that they're not all drunks. <laughs> yeah, it helps. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you're reminding me of, what is it Hemingway who said, uh, write drunk, but make sure you edit sober? <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is Paula Hawkins talking about her new novel, A Slow Fire Burning. Thank you so much. Thank you. Amanda Jayatista's new book, You're Invited, is set in the ritzy part of Sri Lanka, like 90210, she says in this interview with NPR's Aisha Roscoe. And they get to talking about how, actually, Sri Lanka is in the middle of this huge economic crisis with food and fuel shortages. And yet, you'd see the mega-rich and famous party it up on Instagram without a care in the world. It's just one of the ways Jayatissa uses Instagram in the book to portray the kind of fake-out that's bread and butter for thrillers. If Amaya, a Sri Lankan woman living in Los Angeles, is surprised to find out, via Instagram of course, that her former best friend Kavi is engaged, she's even more surprised to find out that it's to her college ex-boyfriend. Messy, messy, messy. She's stunned when she actually gets invited to the lavish, over-the-top affair, 
but she's also determined to keep the wedding from happening by any means necessary. You're Invited is the second thriller from Amanda Jayatissa, who joins us now from Colombo, Sri Lanka. Hello. Hi, Aisha. Thank you so much for having me on the show. I'm glad that you're here. So let's, this story starts with Amaya at the wedding, which is a multi-day affair. Mm-hmm. Can you read us just like that first paragraph of the book? Sure thing. I woke up with bruised knuckles and blood under my fingernails, more rested than I had been in years. I guess this is who I am now, the kind of person who would finally get a good night's sleep after attacking someone else the kind of woman who would fly halfway around the world to stop my ex-best friend from marrying my ex-boyfriend. If that's one too many exes for you, well, it certainly is for me. (laughs) But I'm also the kind of woman who does whatever it takes. So here I am. This is not a spoiler. This is the first page of the book. But Mm -hmm. it's not looking great for Amaya, right? No, no, it most certainly is not. (laughs) So tell us more about Amaya. She's this upper class Sri Lankan woman living in the Mm -hmm. United States. She's in a rough space. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. When we meet Amaya, it's been five years since she's spoken to her best friend. She's pretty much cut ties with most people back home. And she's living in LA. She has opened a little spice shop. She is not doing as well as she could be. But she's also doing this thing where she's keeping tabs on her old friend through Instagram. Um, and she does it through these anonymous accounts. But she likes Multiple to know- Multiple ones. Let's be clear, Amanda. <laughs> she, this is not one Finsta, or which is a fake Insta. She has like four All or right, five. Okay. The end so, so she comments <laughs> like, Go, girl. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So so she's a little beyond those of us that just keep track of our high school friends. Uh, No, no. She's definitely got some issues. uh, And she definitely (laughs) longs to be a part of her friend's life, even from a distance. Uh, So when she gets this news, she gets down to business. The person who is the ex-best friend is Kavi. Mm -hmm. Tell us about her because the thing about Amaya watching her is that on social media... Kavi is now like perfect, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I actually got the idea for Kavi a couple of years ago when I was at dinner with my husband. The next table over were a couple. And because this is Colombo, everybody knows everybody. And the woman was quite famous. And the two of them spent the entire dinner not speaking two words to each other. They were on their phones the entire evening. When I went home, I remember I got on Instagram and I think because we were at the same restaurant, one of her photos popped up. One of those really lovey-dovey selfies (laughs) and this message about, you know, how lucky she is and how she has this perfect life and how she's so thankful for this amazing relationship with this wonderful man. And that really, really stuck with me because I was like, that is not what I saw, you know? I, I saw something totally different. So I... Really drew on that a little bit when I was writing about Kavi. Uh, she was a lot of fun to write, not gonna lie. <laughs> yes. You know, apart from Amaya and Kavi, the other main character in this book is really Sri Lankan high society. And, and mm-hmm. you mentioned like how everyone knows everyone. Mm-hmm. Both women grew up in Colombo 7. Talk to us about what that means and what that culture is like. So Colombo 7 is very much a little bubble on its own. Think sort of 90210, but a whole lot smaller, obviously, because Sri Lanka is a very small country. But it's a very claustrophobic sort of society where everybody knows everyone, everyone's in everyone's business, and they live a life far, far removed from the rest of the country, very much uh, with their own rules. They just deal with things very differently from everyone else. So it it was very interesting for me because I grew up relatively privileged, but definitely not, you know, Kavin De Fonseca level privileged. Okay, Um, so you weren't, you're not a Colombo 07 girl. No, I am not. Um, Okay. but (laughs) But I was very lucky to attend very good schools in here in Colombo. So I had a lot of friends who were from that sort of society. It's very interesting for me even now, um, Aisha, because I, I don't know if you know, but Sri Lanka is going through 
kind of an economic crisis yes, at the yes. moment. Um, for, you know, for the audience, Colombo, Sri Lanka is going through, you know, really devastating inflation. And then there's like a political crisis. There are food and fuel shortages. Just a few weeks ago, we talked to someone who was, you know, reporting from the lines for fuels, which people stand in for days. Yeah, exactly. It's just a very, very tough time for the country in general. But you wouldn't know it if you were to, you know, get on Instagram and look at, you know, some of the posts from people within this community. Sometimes you'd go online on a Friday night and you'd notice that everyone's out partying and doing their thing. And I remember turning to my husband and saying, like, how do they have fuel to get there? Because currently there's no fuel in the country. It's, it's a wild time, essentially. <laughs> You write books, but you also you own cookie stores, which seems like a very wholesome job for someone who <laughs> writes like thrillers. Like, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, especially because I remember we got a shipment in the other day and it came in this really large box. And I was staring at this box for a while. And uh, my brother in law actually was helping out that day. He like looked at me and he's like, what are you doing? And I was like, you think a dead body could fit in that box? <laughs> He's like, you have, you have problems. Just <laughs> bake some cookies and stop thinking about murder. So what is harder? Is it running the cookie stores or writing thrillers? Oh, writing thrillers is easy. Um, oh, that's easy? That's the easy part? Oh, wow. No, let me take that back. It's not that it's easy. It's just that I really, really love doing it. Um, I also really, I'm, to be honest, I've really enjoyed introducing parts of my culture and parts of my country to readers, um, especially in the U.S., because... You know, not very many people know much about Sri Lanka, let alone Sri Lankan weddings. So that's been really fun. And the response that I've gotten from readers has been really nice also. When it comes to the cookies, I definitely enjoy eating them more than I enjoy anything else. Uh, And get this, I only came up with one recipe. Can you guess which one it is? Which one? The red velvet cookie. Oh, okay. The one red bloody looking (laughs) cookie. (laughs) The red velvet oh. murder cookie. That like you should do some little cross branding right here. <laughs> yeah, the murder cookie. <laughs> Amanda Jayatissa, her latest thriller is your invited. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Aisha. I hope I didn't scare you off with the murder cookie. And that's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookoftheday at npr.org. I'm Andrew Limbong. The podcast is produced by Nino Rao with help from Mason Tran and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Justine Kennan, Ian Bjor, Tinbi Ermias, Kira Wakim, Jan Stewart, Melissa Gray, Isabella Gomez, Courtney Dorning, Elena Burnett, Samantha Balaban, and Hadil Al-Salchi. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening.